Hey everyone, this is Christopher, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast interview special. This one is a little different than my usual interviews. I've typically spoken actors and filmmakers before, but this time I have someone from behind the scenes of a streaming service. Brian Luzil is the VP of Business Development of Mumitu. Now, if you're a regular listener to the show, you've likely heard me mention this new streaming service. Brian will get into exactly what Mumitu is, so I won't get into that now, but what I will mention is what is behind the meaning of the name. Weirdly, it never came up in our discussion. From their website, the Mo is for more opportunities to discover great, often underserved content that might get swallowed up by algorithms on other platforms. Me is for me, the filmmakers and the cinephiles who fight the struggle for adequate representation in a world of mega-corporate consolidation. Two is for you in Latin, a nod to our amazing viewers and cinephile audience of people who appreciate the art just as much as the explosions. Okay, now that that is all clear, let's jump into the interview. A huge thank you to Brian for taking the time to talk with me about the service. And I'll go ahead and say thanks to everyone for giving this a listen. Be sure to follow the link in the show notes to check out Momitu for yourself. Brian Luzil from Momitu, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Chris. Uh, it's it's an absolute pleasure. Now, there may be people asking, what is Momitu? So you seem like to be a great person to, to answer that question. I, I was hoping you would tell me what I do. That'd be great. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, Momitu, uh, it's a free streaming app uh, or streaming platform, depending on who you're talking about, streaming service. And uh, we are... Um, a platform that's mainly focused on the underserved content. So uh, looking at independent films, looking at uh, content that is international, so from countries all over the world. Uh, and we actually keep things in the original language uh, with English subtitles. And then we have a, a fair um, expansive co- collection of classic content as well. Um, but you can find Momi2 for free uh, within as long as you're within North America. And you can find it on pretty much every every uh, streaming uh, avenue you can find. So smart TVs uh, or streaming devices such as Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, Android TV. You can even download it on your phone. And, and you can even uh, find us on the web. The only place you can't find us is going to be on like Xbox and PlayStation, so like gaming devices right now. Is that the just restrictions right now or just... The... Uh, it's just where our app is, uh, how we have it built out. Um, we, we can eventually build it out for gaming systems, but uh, there's not a very high percentage of people that are using gaming systems for their streaming purposes. Uh, so we just, you know, we kind of went after the, the more popular devices. Excellent. Gotcha. Now, how did this uh, this service come to be? Well... <sighs> Is, is there was, a short story? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's not really a short story. Um, try to make a long story short. Uh, you know, during COVID, streaming kind of you know took off, right? People mm-hmm. were at home, especially as far as watching content for free. And we looked at that opportunity and said, you know what? You know, it'd be fun to fun to start a streaming app um, and see how it goes. And and we have you know relationships with multiple distributors. Um, in, in the industry and really when we came down to it we said okay there's there's a lot of streaming apps out there how can we make something that is different that is unique because we're not just going to just repurpose right a, another app and hope it succeeds it's not going to happen especially with the bigger players out there like like Tubi and Pluto and Plex and and many others uh, that are free out there right so we looked at the uh, at the uh, industry and said, you know what, there is a need for representation for the underserved. And so when we when we say that underserved term, at least internally, what we mean is uh, again independent films. So filmmakers that don't have as much representation, or even if they were to get onto one of the bigger streaming platforms, they don't get the the limelight, right? They don't get the focus. They're they're just kind of thrown into the mix, and hopefully the algorithm picks it up. Um, which kind of leads into the second thing that's unique about Momi too is that we don't use algorithms. We actually do all of our curation by hand, and by doing that, we actually make the app look the same for each person. So, 
typically, like, right, if you were to use Netflix, Chris, you go on there and you have a profile, right? And you, you click on things you like, things you don't like, when, right when you use the app. And then as you watch things, it builds an algorithm for you and it builds a profile for you. Um, the downfall to that is that you don't get exposed to content that you didn't click on, right? So uh, there's a lot of content that is on even Netflix, which is you know the most popular streaming app worldwide uh, outside of YouTube, that there's content where people people get to a point where they're like, I've seen everything. And it's not the case, right? It's just that the algorithm has only shown you so much and that you've, you're have you getting to a point where you've watched everything via the algorithm, unless you do a deeper dive, which most people don't, right? They just don't want to take the time. They want to find something and go. Um, they don't have as much time to scroll through. Uh, so that's why we did things by hand. We want to make sure that we expose people to content they never knew existed, never knew they loved. And Chris, I'm not sure if you're like a, if you're like a comedy fan or a horror fan or a classic fan, but we make it very easy for our users to discover content that they do love because it's very click, very easy to click on like a genre, go to horror, and you're in a whole thing of horror, right? Um, but we want to expose you to like Korean dramas and and crime, you know, crime dramas and and, and um, series and such from the UK and. Uh, even we have some a really cool Western from Australia, right? Like, I mean, when would you ever be exposed to that, right? Yeah, that's that's kind of how Momi Two kind of came to be. Um, you know, just looking at the opportunity of again underserved content, and then uh, finding a way to present it to people where they could really get involved in content that they never knew existed or never knew that they loved. Yeah, I think going through the the app, my favorite kind of section to go to is the the niche categories and that's where you'll find a lot of those like you were talking uh, the independent i'm a i'm a fan of like the backyard independent film uh the the low budget or the no budget filmmakers yeah uh these these people the so, work the hard. so bad it's the so bad it's good kind of sometimes right but at this but at the, the they didn't have the budget to really stretch to on whether it be the set deck or different locations they're just working with what they got kind of thing yeah Yep, exactly. And, you know, they managed to make a movie and that movie gets into somebody's hands and gets distributed in some manner. And maybe it's on your service. Maybe maybe they're just selling DVDs. And then finally someone comes along and says, well, we can put it on and stream it here. And I, that's those are the things that I love. And yes, sometimes they're rough <laughs> and they're, sometimes they're not that great. But every now and again, you find that gem that you just fall in love with. And then you kind of like, I'm going to see if there's anything more from this person. Absolutely. And, and, and really what people don't kind of keep in mind is that when they think of very prominent directors or, or filmmakers that they know of, what were they doing before you knew them? Right. And that's really, it's, it's funny. Like you look at uh, like Peter Jackson. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, Peter Jackson's like one of one of his first film. We have one of his first films on Momi Two. Um, the name of it's 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 not coming to mind right now, but um, oh, I can find it. But I, I'll find it while we're on here. <laughs> Either way, uh, you know, with Peter Jackson, he he's made tons of films, right? But you all, but everyone knows him for the big studio pictures that he makes now, right? So. You you have to look back into their catalog and really see how did they get there, and sometimes it's by making again like a low budget, uh, whether it be a short film or making an indie like a full feature, but it just doesn't have the quality, like some of the studio films have. Um, you know, you got to kind of look back and, and see where they got their start. So we really love representing those types of films because you never know who's going to be the next you know Peter Jackson or. Steven Spielberg, right, or or uh, James Cameron, or you know, so it's just like you never know. So just gotta you gotta hope hope for the best, and they're out there. Trust me, we just did a uh, a, a premiere for a film in March. Uh, we premiered it on Momi Two. Uh, we had it exclusive for three months. Uh, a movie called Stupid Games. Uh-huh, it was yeah. directed and produced by a, a duo. Um, I'm not. Did you see that one? I did. Have you seen that one on Momi Two? Great. So fun facts about that one now that you've seen it. Um, 
you know, actually, you know what? I won't even tell you. What do you think the budget was on that film? Unless you know. No, I don't remember. Uh, if I if I knew, um, I don't recall anymore. But I know that it was it was effectively a, a single set shoot, and it's kind of more of a. It, it felt like just a group of friends that got together and decided to do a movie. So I'm guessing it was, if it was. Twenty twenty five thousand. I would be, you know, kind of surprised. Yeah. So when we when we premiered the film, we actually asked some people, and some of us, some of people were giving us numbers of like two hundred thousand, one hundred fifty thousand, one hundred thousand. Uh, this film, all in, was made for less than ten thousand dollars. Oh, fantastic! And. They obviously had to pull some favors and and do that right to make it look how it did, um, but the director and producer duo of uh, Nicholas Wendell and Danny Abraham, um, they got to get, they got the opportunity. They got approached and said, "Hey, we can give you you know give you a ten grand to make a film. Would you want to do it?" And they kind of said, "Hey, let's let's take a chance and <laughs> give have it a shot," you know. And they got together with their friend Tanner and said, "Tanner, can you write a script?" And he's like, "Hey, I got this idea in mind. I can write this." And he wrote it within a few days, and it was just like it was wild how it all came together. Um, I got to host the Q and A um, at the at the premiere, so it was fun to kind of learn more about it. But to see what they were able to do for such a low budget film, I mean, it's incredible. And yeah, there's some moments right where you can tell, like, hey. You probably did that in one or two takes, right? You didn't have as much time. They filmed it in six days. Uh, I mean, that it was is impressive. really, really impressive. And the score that they got, they they worked with someone that did the score. It was absolutely incredible. They had a, a, a person that hand drew the artwork uh, for their poster, um, someone from Europe that they had a, a connection with. And so all that to say, that film would have never gotten the 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 limelight right it never would have gotten a premiere it never would have gotten the pr the social media push that it did and after the three months that it spent time with us they got some notoriety it got a bunch of reviews um now it's picked up on other streaming platforms and uh it was actually like a top 20 horror film i think it actually made it into the top five horror films uh, at the time when it premiered on, on Tubi, I mean, it was, it was, it was really seen by a lot of people and it, and it honestly may or may not have ever been seen by that many people if we didn't give it a chance and, and give it that love from the, from the beginning. So, uh, we love, we love working with filmmakers like that. You know, another, another, let me, if I can share another story, I'd, I'd love to yeah, absolutely. share stories about the, some of the successes that we've done so far with, and it's not our success it's the filmmaker's success. Uh, we had another one that we we actually was one of the first exclusive premieres that we did back in December, and uh, it was a, a low budget sci fi film. Again, like thirteen and a half thousand dollars, I think fifteen thousand all in if you include their their film festival runs <laughs> that they did with it, right? And it was this it's this black sci fi thriller um, that it it got some looks, it won some awards. Um, I think I think it's won about like ten to fifteen awards throughout the film festival circuit over about a year's time, and it got uh, some some looks from a distributor. They had a three month window to kind of sell it, and no one wanted it. No one wanted to pick it up. <laughs> it was so weird, right? Like, and there's there's so many platforms out there now. I don't know if it was a lack of interest or a lack of just presentation or whatever it was, but it never got picked up, and. We, my wife and I actually went up and saw it in Hollywood at a, one of the last film festivals that it was in, and they won like best director there and best sci-fi movie there um, at the Silicon Beach Film Festival in Hollywood. And uh, I just said, "Hey, once your three months is up, let's talk. I think I'd I, I would love to premiere it on Momi too and just give it some love." And uh, sure enough, we, we put it up, we did some PR around it, we did some social media push around it, it got watched, and two months later, they ha uh, some, a producer approached them and said, hey, I want to make another movie, we loved what you guys did, do you have another script ready? If so, we can make a film within the next two months. That's brilliant. What's the title of that one? So that one's called An Electric Sleep. Okay. And that is also on Momi too. Um, it was um, made by uh, on Theo my list Brown. to check out now. Yeah, it's it's a great little film. 
And again, great filmmakers. They got very creative during COVID to make this film. I think they made it over the span of two to three years just because of COVID and like not being able to do things in person and then editing and all it's just piecing it all together. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, super proud to be able to represent a film that literally probably would have been put on a shelf Mm -hmm. because it didn't get sold. And now that film is also, again, it's on Momi too. It's on Tubi. uh, It's on Afroland TV. uh, And there's probably five or six other places that it's on, but just it's it's incredible to be able to represent again these films that are underserved and underrepresented and to be able to give them life and see these filmmakers get an opportunity to to move forward in their careers that that means the world to us so i hope we get to do that with many more filmmakers um in the time of momi too yeah i i I hope so and I, i think what i love about those sorts of films and for you to give them a chance to kind of be seen by more eyes and everything is there are times where the parts can be greater than the whole. So Mm -hmm. maybe the film isn't the greatest film. It's not going to, you know, take the world by storm or anything, but there's people that are going to be able to see, well, but the, you know, the effects were really good or that particular actor was really outstanding. That they had really good directions. Uh, the, The cinematography, it's all those little bits and pieces that people can t- kind of see and go, you know, let's let's see what they can do in this, you know, op- with this opportunity. Or let, let me talk to this person and, and give all these individuals uh, an opportunity that they may not have had otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I remember one of the the quotes from uh, Ben and Theo. We, we had them actually premiere it at Cal State Long Beach um, with some students. So they got a sneak peek before it actually went live on Momi 2 um, and got a chance to do a Q&A with the students. And um, I remember them saying that it was like, you know, we did everything we could to make it look like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, you know, you had to get really creative, like with even like the number of hours that people were going through. I mean, I think they did like 40 pages in a day at one point. Um they only had so much time with this house that they use. So they had to get really creative on, on filming it. And it's kind of like, was that take good enough? All right, let's move on. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it was one of those kind of things. And so they did what they could with the budget they had. And, um, but again, great to, to get that movie off the ground and, and have it be seen. And I really hope that we can, uh, and do that for more filmmakers and, and be almost known as a place that does this, right? Like be known for like, Hey, this is where we got our start kind of thing. And, uh, and build a community around that. Oh, I, and I've got friends that are independent filmmakers that I'm absolutely going to be dropping a few names. Uh, (laughs) like, Hey, I got someone you should contact. (laughs) I love that. That's that's great. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Oh, absolutely. I'm I'm definitely going to let them know about this. Yeah, I mean, and we're we're again, we're still getting our start. I mean, we're only about nine months in. I think we're in month ten now, and it's going to take some time to be able to get films represented and seen by more people. Yeah, I mean, we're always willing to take a look at at a film and and see if it if it's a good fit for what we're doing, and and if we can represent a filmmaker and and have them be seen. Absolutely, we're here to do that. I just I just looked it up real quick, but Bad Taste, that was mm. Peter Jackson's film back in the eighties. Oh, did. okay. I was thinking, wasn't uh, Dead Alive mm-hmm. was uh, one of his early ones too? That was the first one that came yep. to mind when you started talking about early Peter Jackson. Yep. So uh, so sorry. It just <laughs> it's <laughs> I just okay. wanted to make sure I added that in. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there there's so many filmmakers out there and. And being able to give, like, obviously, we have to look at the quality of the film, right? We have to look at the quality of the the, the audio and the video and make sure that it's going to work. I mean, stuff that we have back from, like, the 80s and 90s and, and early 2000s, like, yeah, there's going to be some stuff that's got some quality that's not as not there completely. Um, but that's mainly because of the, the equipment that they had available to them at the time, right? right? And they kind of had to do what they could. Um, my father was actually a, a filmmaker, and that... that kind of one of those behind the scene behind the scenes things about why we started Momi too and 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 it's really more of the passion that I have to do what we do is because I grew up on film sets and I, I you know my dad was a director and producer and I, I go to do these moments of like man if if my dad had the access to what we have available today for streaming 
um, and to be seen. I mean, my life would have been totally different growing up too, right? So, um, you know, for him, when he had a film, he had to he had to go to a theater and, and work a deal and and pre prepay for all the tickets ahead of time, and then go out mm-hmm. and sell them on the street and try to fill a theater, right? So, um, just to have it seen be seen by one theater full of people at one showing. I mean, what we're able to do and have people, you know. We can watch a movie from our computer. We can watch it on our television. We can even be on the go and on on you know in the airport or even at work and, and watching something on our phones. I mean, it's it's unreal the level of access that filmmakers have to have their content be seen. And so, if we can help even just bridge the gap of that, we're, we'll definitely you know deem it as a success. And you definitely kind of worked right yourself right into uh, a question I had was talking about the, the uh, you know streaming services as popular and as strong as they've become in the entertainment and, and, and as people that's how people watch a lot of films now it's of course now people are questioning whether there's room for theaters you know anymore and uh, whether there's room for both theaters and streaming services and I think you've kind of answered that in a way that what streaming services can do that theaters can't is give voice to some of the smaller uh, smaller films. You do, you don't have to have the the you don't have to be Disney, you know, throwing out the or or, or Marvel throwing out the next big uh, summer blockbuster. You can be a backyard independent and still have people see your movie. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's got to make financial sense, right? And sorry, my dog's barking in the background, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I'm sure there's an Amazon driver out there somewhere uh, that he's looking for. So I really feel that though there, there definitely is an opportunity for both to exist. Um, if you asked me in the middle of COVID, like in the first year, I'd have been like, no, theaters are not going to come back. There's no chance. Like we got this thing we got to live with now that it, it's, you know, almost like that, that, you know, that, that show, um, what they, they made off of that, where the, the kind of the fungus, goes in and builds within people and they become kind of like these creatures, zombie things. Oh, um, right. Um, well, <laughs> I know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just watched this one. I, the, maybe the film you're talking about. No, it's not a film. It's a series. Oh, um, a series. Okay. Sorry. It was a series, but I either I'll, on that again, the names, I go through so many names all the time, but, um, it's got it's got the guy from uh, he's in the Star Wars series and he's um, gosh he's got that he's got that crazy meme with uh, um, where he's in the back of a car. Why is his name blanking there, there, me? It's there's probably people it's listening three... to this and just yelling the name and <laughs> they're probably yelling the name, but uh, it's it's uh, now it's going to kill me because I'm going to have to look it up and I have Google right here, so why not, Pedro? Pedro Pascal. So, again, to get back on track, COVID was literally that at the time. And I was like, (laughs) no, theaters are not coming back. There's no chance. Um, I even remember talking to a filmmaker, and I was just like, what are you guys going to do now? Like, theaters aren't a thing anymore. (laughs) Like, they're going away. And it's like, it's all streaming now. Like, what are you going to do? He's like, nah, theaters are going to come back. And I was like, I don't know. Like, you know, so we were so deep into it at that time. And so it's like, now, you may not have as many theaters, right? Like, there's going to be theaters that close down, um, and they already have, right? Mm-hmm. There's already been some that have shut down, number of locations and such. But there is still a not, not a nostalgic feel. I mean, for me, it is just because, you know, for you, we we grew up going to theaters to watch movies, right? But like, there's a different feel and a different vibe you get when you're in a theater. Oh yeah, especially when you get like the 4K. You get the 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 full experience theaters that have the, Feel the, sound. You know, the air the air blows on you they like the wetness and like you get the <laughs> smells and all that stuff. I mean, um, you know, I just had someone that that watched uh, Alien Romulus right, and then and they could they had things that they were feeling as they were like as the the little um, the little. Uh, Oh, I can't remember what they call them in the movie. I haven't seen it yet, but the little the little aliens that come after and they they, they attach onto your face, right? So the face huggers again, yeah, yeah, the, those little things. So it's like 
But they, it, there were things that she said, like, she could feel during the movie, like, as she was watching. I was like, that's so trippy, right? So mm-hmm. just that experience alone, um, you know, what they're able to do in, in theaters now, you can't get that at home. And I'm kicking myself that I wasn't able to even watch Avatar 2 yet because I, I want to watch it in a theater, right? Like, I don't mm-hmm. want to watch that movie at home. And I, I'm still waiting for a theater to bring it back so I can I can make sure I get out to it and see it. Um but yeah, I mean, there's there's something that you just get from a theater that it, you you don't get from your television, you don't get from your phone, you don't get that from a computer screen, right? So, um, is there a world for both? Absolutely, and you have to, but it has to make financial sense for the filmmaker, right? You know, um, the studios can buy out the spaces in theaters, right? This and the theaters are more than more than willing to have them, uh, but independent filmmakers can't do that. It just doesn't come around. I think my favorite story during the pandemic, there's an independent filmmaker that managed to go and like buy up all the seats in the theater. It was a local theater or something like that. And because there was no other movies going on at the time, his film was the number one box office for that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Mamito just recently launched a, a new ad campaign, which I think is pretty brilliant. And we've kind of... I think you sort of hinted at the basis of it through your conversation, but you get, you tell the listeners more about this new campaign. We came out this campaign and, and actually it was our, our, we were talking with our PR team about ways we could really bring, you know, users to know who we are. And the biggest thing that we, we wanted to look at was, okay, we want to differentiate ourselves as a platform that is free. Um, and, and we don't want to attack, our brothers and sisters in the free streaming space at all. We respect them. And it's, the fight is definitely a hard fight. Um, but we came with this at the end. So, okay, well, who are we not? And that was really what it came down to is that, you know what? We're not these subscription services. We are a free streaming service and we always want to be free. Um, we have no aspirations at adding a, a subscription tier to get rid of ads and all that stuff. I mean, we want to make sure Momi Two is available to all people at all the you know all the time, um, or as many people that we can reach right with the devices that we're available on. So we looked at that, and um, yeah, I mean, we we just kind of came to this conclusion. It's like we're not Netflix. I, I can't remember who I think I think it was Stacy on our team that threw it out there and. Um, you know, we're not Netflix and we're not Hulu and we're not Peacock and we're not this and we're not that. And like, obviously we're not trying to, we're not trying to go after anyone. (laughs) Like, um, we respect and I, and I personally use Netflix and Hulu myself, but, um, yeah, we came out with the, we're not Netflix. We're not Hulu. We are Momi too. And, um, we wanted to make sure we, we leaned into the, the values of what we are and, uh, we're free we were independent, right? We're not owned by a big studio or a big company or a big corporation. Um, we're just this little mom and pop type shop in a sense that, that started up that wanted to support filmmakers. And, and at the same time, um, we wanted to make sure people knew that we were hand curated, making sure they knew that we take the time to really put some effort into making sure people see some content that they really never would get exposed to on other platforms, whether they exist on there or not. Right. Um, you know, I've been on, I've been in some different live, um, chat rooms, uh, whether it be on different, so, you know, different social media platforms. And, you know, I'll, I'll mention a movie that we have and someone will be like, Oh, it's on, it's on Tubi. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, it's, It probably is on Tubi. Like, that's okay. But how much have you used Tubi and never gotten to see this film, right? Like, never even knew that it was even on the platform, right? The person actually took it and searched it and was like, oh, it's on this platform. And it's like, well, yeah, it is. But the algorithm may not present it to you. And that's what we come in. We really want to take that, that, that time to really make sure people see the types of films that never get seen. And I know the, uh, going through that effort to do the sort of self curating and everything has got to be a, a bit of a task. I, I appreciate that you guys go to that kind of effort. I am curious a little bit how that process works though. Is it, you can't possibly watch everything that comes to the service and decide, Oh, people need to see this or, Oh, maybe not so much that one or, <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, I, I definitely have not seen, 
over 10,000 titles on our platform <laughs> now, um, personally at least. Um, will I get there one day? Probably not either. <laughs> it's like, that's why we have a, a team to do so. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't give away all of our secret sauce, but uh, as far as just even the acquisition standpoint, right? We we work with a, a bunch of different distributors and, and filmmakers and to bring content on. And when we're going through it, like for instance, let me just give you an example. I, I had a distributor that came to me and they gave me a list of 500 titles. And they said, I think these 500 would fit within what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, let me look through them. So I, I looked through the metadata, um, which for those that don't know what metadata is, it's, it's almost like an Excel spreadsheet of, of the title and the director, producer, the actors, the, you know, the, the plot and the, uh, what language it's in and all the different information about the film. Um, and so I, I looked through the metadata and, and then, um, make sure there's things that like, we don't want to represent. Right. So like we don't have, uh, kids content, right. It's stuff, stuff on Momi two is mature, I would say 16 plus is kind of like our our demographic, right? 18 plus, depending on what household you're in. Um, <laughs> and so, but more mature audience, right? So I, I kind of get rid of stuff like that that doesn't fit the mold. Um, kind of look through with maybe some stuff that we just have too much of, right? Like we don't need another documentary about Hitler or, or Mussolini. And like, it's like, we got a couple of each. All right, cool. We don't need those, right? So like just working through that stuff. And, and then get down and start looking at like posters, like looking at artwork, because if you put yourself as a, as a user, as a viewer, what am I going to see first? You're going to see the poster first, first and foremost. And then secondly, you're, you may check out the trailer. Some people don't like watching trailers because they don't want to give, have too much given away, but more than likely a person that's really interested, like, Hey, am I going to spend 90 minutes of my day, you know, on this movie without watching the trailer? Maybe not. Some people love it, though. Like, love doing that and going in blind. So I go through trailers. I go through the artwork. And then I'll spot check, like, the um, audio and video and all that stuff. And, and when I had these 500 films, we ended up only taking, like, 80 of them. And so there's a lot of work that goes into that to really find the films that we know we want to represent. And we know that it will fit within the mold of what we're doing or maybe some stuff that we just don't have enough of. Um, so sometimes we're maybe willing to take a little bit more of a chance on content that we just don't or we're not representing enough. And and that's kind of the process of where we get to selecting the films. And then from there, our team, if you look in our, and especially our niche categories, are really unique names and, and collections of things. And we kind of just... Um, our operations teams break things down so that way you can get really fun and, and make sure it's a little more engaging for the users instead of just the typical, okay, here's some drama, here's some comedy, like, like no, here's here's some uh, werewolves and vampires uh, collection and something that's not just horror, right? Like, we want to get really specific um, and, and just kind of engage with our, our, our audiences, so... Um, that's, that's kind of how we go about it. And then we have some, we, we do have some machine learning stuff that's built in almost to more randomize the content, but we're not in there like everyday moving titles. Like <laughs> we set up the collections and then, and then present them that way. I love that you've, uh, said the artwork plays a factor. And I, I, as someone that grew up going to the video store, what was the thing that was going to get you to pick that it, for me it started out vhs off the shelf yep. to see and read the back to see what it's about the artwork and that is 100%. something that you know the poster or the uh the box art that on a on a video it, it feels at times to be a lost art these days you know it's just oh here's a silhouette of someone's face and make it red okay great thanks what does that tell me? You know, <laughs> now some I, I love the the old ones where it's like the poster. Oh, that looks amazing! It's not in the movie, but it got you to check that film out. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's something we actually did with that movie I told you about, an Electric Sleep. Um, they had an original poster that they had that they used for the festival circuit, and we said, you know what? We think it can be more engaging. We think that. 
part of maybe why it's not getting picked up so quickly right now is maybe it's the artwork Hmm. and sure enough we updated the artwork made it really cool with this like one of these cool features in the film is like where they they look the guy they look up and they they kind of start scanning the 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 the, 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 just the, the space in front of them but it's really coming from like almost like glasses that are kind of built into people's heads like it's not like a special I wear anything that comes up like it's not mm-hmm. like the uh the apple um you know the 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 the, no, the, the vision Google pros, glass right oh well, yeah yeah it's nothing like that it's just a thing that you just kind of like look up and it's there and they start moving stuff around i mean it was really cool so like we're like hey like that is actually a really cool thing we need to feature that in the poster and so right over the eye there's this like blue glass thing that we bit that we had it added in to really make the poster pop and it's doing well i mean people people again the poster is going to attract you yeah and so yeah we look at we look at posters first and foremost to make sure that like if you're looking at a screen full of titles what is going to be really what is going to make it stand out you know and um that's actually something that we even educate um student filmmakers on and I'm not, I'm not sure if that's even something that you had in your uh list of questions there but we we actually founded a film festival for college students no i did and that's awesome i'd love to hear more about that yeah yeah so um one of the the film festival we created and again inspiration from my father being a filmmaker went to ucla and just again the opportunities that he could have potentially had if he had something like this too there's no there's not really a lot of film festivals out there that are focused on students Mm -hmm. and -and up-and-coming filmmakers right um these student filmmakers have to compete against very tenured film filmmakers sometimes and um very experienced and have access to more money and better equipment and all that stuff they're just using what they have at their school they hopefully get a grant they apply for it kind of thing to get some money or sometimes just have backing from family right to help them fund or do you know those little things for fundraising right so they're making these short films and and trying to compete with the real world which is very difficult to do so i looked at it so okay we can maybe support them and support the future filmmakers. So we started this f- film festival for college students called the Momi Two College Shorts Film Festival. And what we do is we actually take their films and put them up onto our streaming platform, onto Momi Two, for an entire month. So they get seen by more people than they ever could have imagined being seen by. Um, instead of just putting it up on YouTube or or hoping that some small regional film festival selects them because they're not getting picked up by south by southwest or (laughs) we're going to can right i mean it's not that's just not in the cards unless they had like a really really good budget um and they're and they're probably either at like chapman or nyu or or usc or grad student somewhere right so we saw the opportunity to support the future future of filmmaking and we put these films up they get seen um we did our we just did our second festival this past uh, June and uh, during the month of May, we had 69 films on Momi Two, represented by 38 different colleges and universities across the nation, and actually one from Canada. Um, we had seven different genre categories, and uh, the coolest thing about the festival, I would think, uh, in my mind, is that we were able to partner with a, a another company called. Uh, at the time, they're called V Channels. They just rebranded their name is now Insurgents. Um, but they actually uh, ponied up uh, a cash prize for uh, one of the films to be turned into a feature film and be directed by a student filmmaker. Nice. Um, so super cool opportunity for this filmmaker to be able to make their first feature film, and they literally just graduated from from college. They actually they graduated from Ringling uh, College of Art and Design, and uh, so really really excited for that filmmaker and and and. We're going to be able to premiere that film on Momi too, and I'm hoping that we can actually get it filmed this fall and and have it in post and ready for uh, uh, hopefully a trailer ready to be able to premiere the trailer at next year's festival. It would be really cool to have that come full circle. But the reason I, I come to that from the posters 
and and again we can talk more about the festival if you want if you'd like but the posters were really cool is that we're able to work with those filmmakers and and tell them like i remember this one poster in particular it was called clicker and it didn't have like it was not engaging like mm-hmm. that you could tell this student just threw it on there and just said hope it sticks i got something done right I said hey that's not gonna work right like no one's gonna watch your <laughs> film and so um we hope we hold some educational panels th- across the uh, the time while their films are up so we we talk about filmmaking we talk about distribution we talk about sorry filmmaking distribution we talk about uh we do like an open q a with all the filmmakers and we also talk about marketing and so the marketing aspect of it was hey guys your poster is really what grab it, grabs people you gotta have an engaging poster and i will say at the end of the festival if you looked at the films that performed the best they all had engaging posters right now they're short films so they don't have any trailers um unless they're longer but we didn't put trailers up but either way that poster is the only thing that's going to grab someone that doesn't that that wasn't told to go watch the film by you right like so they 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 were able to learn that so that hopefully in the next film that they make and or the next short that they make or or their maybe their first feature or whatever they're able to do they know that artwork is so important just to grab someone to even give it an opportunity to be seen i i like that you're kind of giving them an idea of things to think about that maybe they wouldn't think about uh when they're making their film i think a lot of people they they might go in as like oh great i've made a movie i have a movie now what (laughs) <laughs> you uh present the opportunity like okay well did you think about yeah the, like you said marketing did you d- distribution uh yeah artwork all these things that they maybe all didn't have on the forefront of their mind you know they they were concentrating on making that film which they need well to they're do. filmmakers they're not but, marketers right yeah so, exactly but you but you have to be that's the thing is in, especially in today's world with the barrier to entry now is so inexpensive compared to how much it was 20 years ago to make a film, right? Like there's people that have made feature films on their cell phones now. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it's, it's a thing, right? It's, cr- I think there was a really famous filmmaker that literally made a, a feature film on their cell phone, like all cell phones, only iPhones. Mm-hmm. And they obviously were able to increase the frames per second and all that stuff. And they had to like, you know, download all the stuff off their phone so their phone wouldn't just go to the fritz, right? So, <laughs> again, it was a very, very lengthy process, but it is possible. You can film a short film easily on a, on an iPhone nowadays. And so just that barrier to entry is so much easier now that you have to differentiate yourself in some way compared to other filmmakers. And, again, what's the simplest way? Well, first is your poster, Right. Then we talked to them even about some of the marketing aspects of what are you doing before you even shoot? Are you writing things into your films? I, I, I go to Ryan Reynolds a lot because it's just such a, it's a low hanging fruit for all the Deadpool movies, but great marketing across the board for Deadpool. But there's stuff that they literally shot just for social media. And I'm not sure if you saw that recently, they released it where, where Wolverine, you know, uh, Hugh Jackman was wearing, or no, I think it was actually Ryan Reynolds or a dead, someone in a Deadpool costume was wearing the the script, was wearing like a big <laughs> script. It was just like this thing around their neck, and it had this big poster board in their front of their, and it had Hugh Jack, who was, he was actually reading his lines off of the card, right? Now, they didn't do that in the mo- when they were doing the movie at all, but like they did this literally just for social media. Mm-hmm. And it was like... Are you doing that? Are you filming behind the scenes stuff? Like there should be someone on your set that is literally just trying to capture behind the scenes stuff, interviews with your actors, your directors, whatever, so you can use that for social media and build that up. Again, just another way to get creative to hopefully attain one more eyeball. And maybe that eyeball has like, you know, 150 to 200,000 followers on social media or even sometimes millions of followers on social media. They could say, hey, go check this film out. And all of a sudden you have, you know, another 10,000 people that have seen your film because of something you did, you know, during, you know, behind the scenes stuff for social media. So, again, you just have to you have to get creative. You have to set yourself apart. And we try to teach these filmmakers that because, again, they're not learning this in school. 
Yeah, they're probably learning more of the uh, the, the nuts and bolts of filmmaking. But like, as you as you said, now you, it's not enough to just be a filmmaker. You don't have the army of people that are going to do all the promotions and this and that for you. So you have to be a creative marketer as well as a, a filmmaker in order to get yeah. your stuff seen. And you and you never know where that the big buzz is going to come from. Like you said, you could post a little behind the scenes and get on Instagram or, you know, make it an Instagram reel or whatever. And some talk show host, some celebrity or something uh, happens to come across it and go, Hey, that's hilarious. And share it. Now you've got all kinds of buzz about this film that you're making. Yeah. I mean, it's um, a friend of mine who is not a filmmaker. She's actually a food blogger, but again, it's the same, same kind of, uh, uh, example in a sense where uh, same principle right is that she was working a full time job you know an, a 9 to 5 job doing uh, I believe she was doing PR or, or, or human resources I, I can't remember exactly what she was doing but she was working for a co- an advertising company I believe and she just loved to cook and it was just one of those things. She had a, she had her own little web, her little blog that she had at the time when she would call it a little blog at the time, and it was like <laughs> it was very small, and it was just for fun. Like she loved to cook. Like right. she she bonded with her 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 mom over you know baking growing up, and um, she just literally wanted to make some toast. Like it was so <laughs> simple, and she thought she had bread at home. So she got all these things to make this toast and this healthy toast. And she got home and she didn't have any bread and she was kicking herself. (laughs) And then she saw a sweet potato that just happened to be sitting on her counter. She got creative and she's like, well, what if I slice that up and toast it with it get soft enough, almost like bread. And maybe it's, maybe it's a healthy version of bread. Like she just got creative and she made sweet potato toast sweet potato toast if you don't know became like this viral sensation she did it on she put it on her blog i think she may have put it on social media one of her friends saw it and shared it and then like some celebrity saw it and shared it and all of a sudden she had glamour magazine reaching out to her to do a full spread and (laughs) then she had the dr oz show hitting her up and um shout out to uh to kelsey or also known as little bits of but (laughs) the cool thing is that she, she took something that was just like, it it wasn't going to be anything, right? Like she was just literally making toast and it became this viral sensation because this famous person ended up sharing it. And then glamor, Dr. Oz are showing her up. Now she is a full time influencer and creator. And I think she has like 160,000 followers on Instagram or something like that. She has her blog. She has her website. She does, you know, promos with all these different companies, and she also um, she also gets involved with. Um, she has a, a her own book, like her own cookbook, and she has her own ebook for cocktails and mocktails. And I mean, all of this started from the first thing she did, right? right? And so now everyone sees all this stuff. Oh my gosh, like look at all everything she's doing, right? Kind of the Peter Jackson reference of earlier. It's mm-hmm. like, well, you got to go back to what they were doing when they started and they were just hoping to make it, right? And it, it, it you just never know when you do something, who's going to see it and how it can really take off. And I mean, for some filmmakers, gosh, they just get super lucky or just have the right connection. But the relationships you have and with people are just so important because you just never know who that next person is that's going to help take off your your film or, in her case, her her toast. Right. So. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, we're kind of running a little on the lengthy side here and everything. And I know it, it, it's getting late in the afternoon for you. It's getting late in the evening for me. So I want to thank you, Brian, for taking some time out of your day to talk to me about Mamito, about the festival. Um, hopefully be, be sure to uh, maybe uh, send me a link uh, if there is one uh, for the festival exclusively. So I can add that to the show notes and, and let people know about it. And um, I just encourage everyone to go check out Momitu and you will find something that you want to watch on this, on this service. There is so much there 
and so much interesting things. And you'll find something you didn't know you loved, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's definitely our, our goal and our mission to, to uh, as, we, as we present content, again, to, to expose people to things that they never knew they loved. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely send you the information. If, if you've made it this far in the podcast, thank you. Uh, I'm not that interesting of a person, but I really appreciate you <laughs> taking the time to get to this point in the podcast. Um, but if you if you're not already, please follow us on social media. Um, it's at free momi two, very simple. So free and then m o m e t u. You can find us there on all social media platforms. Um, so just give us a follow, and then like Chris, I'll send it to you. But uh, if you're if you're looking at uh, the film festival, it's on Instagram only. And that's at Momi Two College Film Fest, and uh, but I'll send that information to you. But thank you again for for reaching out, and I'm glad that we were able to do this, and and hopefully again we can do this uh, in the future. Oh, absolutely, I hope so. And I also add to anyone listening, if start using the the app, whether it's Roku or on your phone or on whatever, if you have any questions or any problems. The customer service with Momitu has been fantastic. I was having some issues with the app, and I sent out an email, and I was like, the next day, I got a reply, oh, it's probably this, let me, you know, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that was it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's it kind cool. of blew me I'm away. Glad, I'm glad our support team were able to help you out so quickly. And, yeah, I mean, we we, we definitely want to take a, a lot of pride in, in each and every user's, um, you know, experience on our platform so if there's ever any issues yeah feel free to hit up our support email or message us on social media and we'll do our best to get back and, and hopefully solve your issue if we if there is one yeah it, it was a lot of fun because i'll actually share this too it the movie i was watching oh no of course now i want to sell the story and i can't remember the name of the film but it was one of those very low budget like 19 late 70s early 80s uh backyard sci-fi films and they asked, well, what were you watching? I'm like, well, <laughs> kind of embarrassed, but it was Alien Invader or something like that. And, and the reply was like, never be embarrassed about what you love. <laughs> like, fair Absolutely enough. Not. I mean, <laughs> you, th that's the thing is whether it's a guilty pleasure or not, like you never know who's going to love what. And um, I, I think, you know, for me, when I got married, I, I found out that you know, there's a lot that I didn't ever get exposed to mm -hmm. because my wife's profile is different than mine, right? On the different, uh, different streaming apps. Um, but her preferences are a lot different than mine, right? Like, and there's stuff that I exposed her to as well that she never knew, you know, existed. And, um, yeah, you just never know. So, uh, never, never be, yeah, never, never shy away from what you enjoy and what you love because one, you know, one man's trash is another one's Trevor treasure, right? So exactly. All right, well, Brian, thank you very much again for taking some time and, and speaking with me today. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Chris.